One of the most dangerous and fearful days was April 20, 1999, a high school in Colorado, where two angry misfits shot up teachers and fellow students. One killer apparently was quite angry at God and so asked several victims before he shot, do you believe in God? And one victim was Val, a 16-year-old, who was hiding under a desk when she was shot in the arm, stomach, and chest. And as she lay on the floor crying out in pain, the killer pointed a gun at her head and said, do you believe in God? I tried to put myself in her shoes this week. What would I say? I want to live, but I'm bleeding out. What are my options? Yes, I do. No, I don't. Or what do you want to hear? Val said, yes, I do. And then closed her eyes expecting to die. But the killer walked away to shoot up other classrooms. And so she's alive today. And one of the most fearful and dangerous moments on earth, somehow she was able to be unafraid and unashamed to speak what was true. That's one reason Paul writes to Timothy. This fearful young pastor. I'll just rehearse a few of the verses we heard. Never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord, Timothy. Don't be ashamed of me either, though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the gospel. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. Timothy, Mike, Farringdon, friends, those watching, God's calling us to be unafraid and unashamed in these very uncertain and fearful days. I've needed this because since high school I've suffered from a, a phobia that actually has a psychological name to it. It's called catagelophobia, catagelophobia, which is the fear of standing out from others, the fear of ridicule, being laughed at and rejected because you're different, catagelophobia caused me to buy $60 designer jeans in high school uh, instead of the $6 Zellers brand I was used to wearing. I didn't even like them. They weren't that comfy. But I didn't want to be laughed at like I couldn't afford good jeans. Catagelophobia caused me to start smoking in high school because my friends were doing it. and I didn't want them to laugh at me. Now, thankfully, it always made me gag, so I never got addicted. Catagelophobia caused me to lie many times to my friends. Uh, on one school day, my youth pastor from church had arranged to take me out for lunch. He said, pick the restaurant and I'll pay. Nice. Well, I picked a restaurant far away from the school. Because I didn't want any of my friends seeing me with him and saying, who's that? So we went to the restaurant and waitress takes our order and, and he says, thank you and God bless you. And I thought, she didn't even sneeze. What do you mean God bless you? I was starting to get embarrassed. The food comes and he says, I'll pray and he does and he goes on and on with like a churchy prayer and not just rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thank God for the grub. And I was wondering, who's, who's watching us here? And 
And then after the meal, to pay, he gives her cash and a little colorful tract that tells her how she can become a Christian. He said, thank you for your excellent service, and here's another little something that you might find helpful in your life. I thought, oh, he's really religious. We go back to school, and I see in the parking lot my friends waiting to go in. And I say to Murray, uh, you can just drop me off here, like 100 meters from the school. He says, no, no, I'll take you to the door, don't worry. I said, no, I, uh, I need some fresh air before math class. So he dropped me off, and I said, one of my friends saw. Who's that? I said, who's what? The guy who dropped you off, who's that? And I said, uh, I couldn't say my youth pastor. That, that's my neighbor. He sometimes has to drive this way, and so he drops me off at school. Catagelophobia kept me from speaking up and just telling the truth. I want to thank God for Pastor Murray for being so religious. I think he's one reason I'm standing here today. Because I saw in a man someone unafraid and unashamed to speak up for God. God knows we have this fear. That's why he wrote through Paul to Timothy, don't be afraid or ashamed to speak up for me. Be willing to suffer for my sake. I've given you my spirit so you won't fear, so you won't be timid and quiet, but so you'll have my power, love, and self-control. Now, on Timothy's day, it wasn't just the fear of being laughed at. <laughs> His fear was Emperor, evil Emperor Nero is on the throne, arresting Christians, throwing them to the lions, literally. They made a sport out of it. They sold tickets. Come see these uh, lions who've been starved for a week. Watch them maul these innocent Christians. History says he would uh, nail Christians to crosses and douse them with oil and light them on fire at night to be like street lights for the road. He's already got Paul in prison. Timothy figures I'm probably on that hit list. Does he have reason to be afraid? It's a legitimate fear. Pain, persecution, arrest, jail. I mean, many of our fears, we have to say, are illegitimate. They're not based in reality. I was reading about medical or psychological terms for, for fear, different phobias, and there's actually one they've said called phobia phobia the fear of ever being afraid well that's just made up in someone's head it's not grounded in reality and then I read about a lady whose fear was cryptophobia which is the fear of hidden things and uh, her fear came out at night in her bed because it was a bed raised four inches off the floor with four legs, and she always feared what was under there. She would stay up half the night because she couldn't sleep. And finally, her husband had had enough and said, you need help. And uh, so she goes to a psychologist and says, I can't sleep because under my bed could be a monster or an animal or an assassin. Six months later, $6,000 later, she's still afraid to go to sleep. So what does the husband do? He unscrews the legs of the bed. And now it's flat on the floor and he says, see, nothing can fit under there. And somehow she could go to sleep after that until she started fearing what might be hiding in the closets. <laughs> but it's all imagined. It's not based in reality. Timothy's fear, it's real. And so what's the solution? 
Timothy, it's not just uh, screw up your courage and repeat after me, I will not fear, I will not fear, I will not. No. My Holy Spirit within you will give you power greater than that legitimate fear. Power so you keep going and you don't quit. Power so that you can even love those who are against you and not turn them into your enemy. My Holy Spirit within you. Every year they put out a list of the 50 most dangerous places to live in the world if you're a Christian. Places where it's actually illegal. Number one on that list, the worst for 16 years straight is North Korea. And then Afghanistan. I'll just give you the top 10. Somalia. Uh, Pakistan. Three more from Africa. Sudan, Eritrea, Libya. Three more from the Middle East. Yemen, Iraq, Iran. I learned about one 26 years ago when a lady out of the blue wrote to me and asked for a course in how to study the Bible. Said in the letter she was a Christian and in her country, which I'd never heard of, sadly, there was no means to study the Bible. It was 99.9% .9 Muslim. I, I researched it. Little place called Qatar. Or some say Cotter. And it was hard to read, not only because of the broken English, but she wrote in half words and half pictures. Uh, for I'm a Christian, she wrote I'm a, and she drew a fish. Did you know that's the ancient symbol, code word, to say you're a Christian? For I want to study the Bible, she drew a little book with a ribbon. And she enclosed a check for 200 US dollars to say that I hope this covers the cost. And then she said, please don't put anything obvious on the outside. Please wrap the materials three times. I got the sense she could probably be arrested or killed if they found out. And I remember over three years, uh, she took two courses and aced them. Like whenever she sent back her answers, it was just perfect. We communicated seven or eight times by mail, and then I never heard from her. And I always prayed, Lord, I, I pray you're keeping her safe. She was unafraid unashamed of her faith, said, I'll take the risk because I want to know my God more. I need his word in my life. I believe there's a day coming for us in Canada where persecution will be more severe than we can even imagine. What have we had to suffer to date? Maybe being laughed at? Maybe excluded from some social circle because we're too religious? But Jesus promised all disciples, in this world you will have tribulation, John 16, 33. And then he gives the promise, take heart. Or don't freak out. I have overcome the world. I'll bring you through it. I'll help you. Don't worry. And there have been millions of martyrs, people who've been willing to die for their faith. And I can't believe we will go on forever without that same test. Our own Savior publicly stripped, humiliated, beaten, crucified on a cross because he stood for God's truth. He wasn't afraid or ashamed. 
And why would we, his followers, expect any different? Jeremiah 12, 5 says, or asks, If you can't keep up with humans now, how will you ever run with the horses? Great question. If you can't keep up with humans now, how will you ever run with the horses? Meaning, if we cave now when there's virtually no persecution, how will we stand when that day comes? We won't. So these are important days of preparation, like a soldier who has to go through boot camp to get ready for that inevitable day of battle. I love how Hebrews 13 confidently says, The Lord is my helper, so I won't be afraid. What can people do to me? And this was written by someone who knows they can throw me in jail. They can take my family away. They can ruin my life. He still says, what can people do to me if the Lord is my helper? That's just like Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He's the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The answer is no one. I'm pretty sure we're each going to have an opportunity to speak up for God this week. And it probably won't be a, a dramatic or drastic event where our life's in danger. No, it'll be just a simple conversation. It's an opportunity to prepare now for that day when we will be forced to choose. You really believe in God? You really believe the Bible? You sure you want to commit to that? A final point before our final story. Paul mentions three people by name later in the passage. I didn't read them because they're hard names. But he mentions Phygelus, Hermogenes, and Onesiphorus. I'm going to shorten those to P and H and O, okay? He says, P and H deserted me when I was jailed in Rome. They were afraid and ashamed of me. Someone probably asked them, you, you know Paul? You, you follow Jesus too? Uh, wh what do you want me to say? That's P and H. They're forever recorded in history as too afraid to stand up for the gospel. But then he names Onesiphorus. Oh, says he was not ashamed of me and my chains. He was not afraid to visit me in prison and help me. And Paul basically says his courage kept me going when it was hard. I heard God say, Timothy, be like O. Mike Ratti, be like O. Farringdon Church, be like Onesiphorus. Unafraid, unashamed. And that reminded me just how important we are for each other. You and I know it's hard to stand alone, to be a, a stick out like a sore thumb and go against the crowd. It's hard alone. But together, together our, our courage grows because that word encourage literally means put courage into. When we get together like this, we're putting courage into each other for the week. We're saying, let's stand together. That's what Onesiphorus did for Paul. That's what a guy named Pee Wee did for Jackie. I don't know if you saw the movie 42. More than just a Hollywood tale, it's a real-life story of Jackie Robinson, who wore number 42, the first African-American baseball player ever. Uh, 75 years ago, he broke into the league, first for Montreal and then for Brooklyn. The movie shows, of course, how Major League Baseball was 
extremely racist and segregated. Uh, he got in just because of his incredible talent. But he was far from accepted. Opposing players mocked him. Coaches yelled at him, at him. Crowds booed him. His own teammates wouldn't sit with him or eat with him, and they called him the N-word. And many times Jackie thought of quitting because the persecution was relentless. But he prayed daily for courage. And he kept on just playing his best. The movie shows how in one game the crowd was especially vocal in their hate. And one, the opposing coach was yelling insults. And he stood in the, the on-deck circle. And he said, God, I don't know how much more of this I can take. And a teammate named Pee Wee Reese came up to him and just put his hand on his shoulder. Didn't say anything. But the crowd stopped booing, the coach shut up, the, the players. It, it got silent. Jackie says, that gave me the courage to go up to bat and to keep going up to bat. Pee Wee didn't say any words, but he didn't need to because just standing and saying, I'm not ashamed of this man, my friend, and I'm unafraid to tell you that and show you that. And our Savior stands being laughed and mocked and sworn at and booed in this world and simply asks, will you have the courage to stand with me and be identified as mine? And we say, God, help me. Yes. Lord, I pray for each one who has heard this word that you would now give grace so we can mean it and live it. As the old hymn says, Lord, give us courage for the living of these days. Because you've promised to, we thank you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat>